بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ان اور پریویس لیکچر وی آر ڈسکسنگ اباؤٹ فارمولیٹنگ دا ریسرچ ڈیزائن وی ہیو کنکلوڈیڈ ٹو مین ٹاپکس دیٹ دیٹ ور اباؤٹ دا ریسرچ ٹاپک ریسرچ کوشچنز اینڈ آبجیکٹوز اینڈ دین کریٹیکلی ریویوئنگ دا لٹریچر وین وی آر اسٹارٹنگ ود دا ٹاپک آف اوور چوائس اینڈ سلیکٹنگ دا آبجیکٹوز اینڈ ریسرچ کوشچنز وی آر ایکچولی پوزنگ اوور سیلف under a scientific inquiry in which we want to investigate a simple question that has to be answered in scientific way using one or the other methodology using one or the other way of conducting literature search and this way we are moving further stepwise that how to do research in a rigorous manner we have concluded that literature review is one of the very important part and after that we started that how we can formulate the research design and in our previous lecture we have concluded that research strategy is a general plan that we have to have so that we can be in a position to know what actually we want to do how we want to do and what are the ways and sources that we are going to use to implement our research questions and objectives and to get our results and analysis done. In previous lecture we have also seen some ways of conducting research that is explanatory versus exploratory and descriptive research. We have also talked about research strategies that can be experimental, that can be survey research, that can be case studies, that can be number of other things like ethnographic or archival research. We have also seen that we have to have some time horizon and also the research plan, how we conduct research, what kind of time horizon we are going to use, whether we are going to use a survey data, whether we are going to use a case study method and within case study we have seen that we have single or multiple cases and we have holistic or embedded cases. Or we can have mix and match kind of thing where we can match or mix single case study with holistic or embedded or multiple case study with holistic or embedded case studies. And this is how we proceed with the collection of our data or information that we need. And that we need based on our research question and objective. One thing must be clear from the very beginning till the end of the research process that the most important aspect of your research is the topic that you want to research on. The another aspect of importance is your research question that you want to answer, that you want to research on, that you have in your mind. And the third important thing is your research objectives. If you have clear research objectives, identified and clarified research question based on a research topic you want to research on, I think more than 50% of your research analysis is clarified, clear and distinctive. So once you are clear about your research questions and objectives, then you can easily move on to literature review and then formulating a research design. In previous lecture, we have also seen few small things of how, uh, for example, explanatory research is done, how exploratory research is done what is descriptive research it can be explanatory it can be exploratory it can be a part of research or it can be a whole research so there are a number of ways that you can write descriptive research and that can be the whole research paper or dissertation or for a paper you have write small chapter which describes the data and your research in a descriptive way that can also be a descriptive research which is part of your full research this is how you move further and we have also talked about survey research, experimental research and case studies and we have seen in details what are they, how are they conducted, what are their key features, why to do, when to do these kind of research and why not these kind of research and after that we are also continu continuing formulating the research design topic in our today's lecture and we'll talk about action research. What is action research? how we conduct it and what kind of benefits we can get from it. 
Action research focuses and emphasizes on the purpose of research. What is the purpose of research? It's actually talking about the management of change. If change is occurring, how we manage these changes? For example, a recent example in action research can be the vaccination campaign in Pakistan. That is the research that one has to conduct to understand whenever the change is happening, how to manage that change. And from action research, we have to understand one very important aspect that it is a research in action and it is not the research on action. So when you are doing some research, already planning, already conducting researches which are bringing changes in the social fabric of the society, which are change, bringing changes in the fabric of the organization you are working for, and you become as a researcher part of the organization, you are basically doing action research. And your research must focus and emphasize on the purpose of research. What is the purpose of research? Whether you want to overhaul the whole system of organization you are working for, whether you overhaul the functioning of, of, for example, stock markets in your country, what is the main purpose? Where is your focus and emphasis? So this is how you actually do action research, which is related to your actions rather than on your actions. So it rel relates to the involvement of the practitioner in research. So the practitioner who is going to use your research is also involved in that. And in particular, a close collaboration between practitioner and research. So the researcher should involve the practitioner in it, number one. Number two, the collaboration between researcher and practitioner. So researcher is the one who is going to conduct research. Practitioner is the one who is going to use the output of that research. So they are not only in close collaboration between uh, with each other, but also research uh, collaborator uh, collab uh, the practitioner is part of the research so this is another important aspect the third and the final thing in action research is that its implication beyond the immediate project so its implication are wider and long term it should not be that you do a project in which you do some actions or some research work or some analysis and you come up with some conclusion and when the project ends your research basically finishes but action research is a kind of research where if research project finishes its impact remains and it's not only long term but it's widespread also because researcher have collaboration with practitioner also in other words, it must be clear that a result could inform other contacts. So one has to understand the context in which one is going to do or conduct the research. If you understand the, the research conductance, where you are conducting your research, what is the context, what is the contextual analysis where you are working in, the environment in which you are working in, you will be in a good position to do a, a valid action research. Validity is also a very important point that we will see in detail in, in today's lecture that why or how we can have reliable and valid results. But three things are very important when you are conducting action research. Number one, focus and emphasis on the change management. It, number two, it involves practitioner in the research process. Number three, it should have implication beyond the immediate projects. So three important things, focus and emphasis, involvement of practitioner, and implication beyond research project. If these three things can be achieved or have been done, that's definitely action research in its full swing. If it is not the case, we have to understand that our research focus, research design, and research strategy is misspecified because we are unable to get full concentration and full implication of our action research. What are the key features of action research? As it's already explained, action research is research in action. When you are doing it, it's actually research and not on the action you have already done. It involves practitioners. We have already discussed that action research have a strong involvement of those who are going to be the end user of your research product. Research become part of the organization. 
So researcher who is conducting research on one or the other aspect of management change, he becomes the part of the organization. So if he is working for a company or a financial firm or a services sectors company or organization or institute, he becomes the part of that. When he becomes the part of that and he implements his own research agenda and tries to see how the management can happen when the change is happening and how to manage the changes that are happening with the passage of time in an organization or institute he is working for, he is in a position to understand the whole phenomena and the researcher can also conduct research in action rather than on action. In action research is one of the good example of this action research is vaccination campaign. I've already explained that vaccination campaign in Pakistan nowadays is one of the very good example of action research. Promotes change within the organization. It helps in promoting change within the organization because researcher is a part of organization and those who are practitioners or the end users of the research, they are also part of the research. And if that is the case, then it helps in promoting change within organization. It can have two distinct focuses. One, it has the aim. Two, it needs the sponsor. It, it fulfills the needs of the sponsor. So aim of the research is focused. Its focused aim is the most important thing. So for this organization, we need change management in this and that aspect. Human resource management, for example, marketing, another example, finance, administration. These are one or the other examples that can have needs for change management. And if that is the case, how people are going to use the outcomes of the research while researcher is working with them is having a strong focus of your research and that is strong focus can be used as a splendid aim of the research and the second is the needs of the sponsor who is going to pay what are his or her needs a sponsors needs are in your outline in your aim in your focus and then you try to manipulate your research work so that sponsors can have the splendid outcome that they want to have. This is one of the important aspect of uh, action research. So we have to have few things in mind when we are conducting action research. And these few points are the key features of action research. The first thing is that it's research in action rather than on action. It involves practitioners who are going to end, uh, who is going to be the end users of the research. Researcher become the part of the organization. It promotes change within organization and can have two distinct focus. One is focused research aims. Second is focused needs and uh, focuses on the needs of the sponsor. This is how we can move further in action research. What about we have also talked about ground, uh, grounded theory. We didn't go into the detail, but when we talk about research strategies, various research strategies, we have also talked about survey research, we talk about experimental research, we have talked about case study, ethnography, we have talked about action research, and we have also talked about grounded theory. If you go into this research onion, we will have a research onion in which third or fourth layer is about research strategy, and in that research strategy, you have various research strategies in which grounded theory is one of the important thing or important research strategy. It starts with the collection of data without the formation of initial theoretical framework. So you start collecting data without the formation of initial theoretical framework. So data collection is started, but you don't have in your mind what kind of theoretical framework you are going to use to, to analyze your data. And theory is created from data made by the series of observation. A good example of this kind of research is 
the data that is collected at national level having various components. For example, this Pakistan Social Living Standard Measurement Survey, PSLS MS, which is conducting data from 1998 2001 to 2015. So every round is conducting data on, let's say, health, education, consumption, expenditure, income, household livelihoods, household conditions, this and that kind of stuff. So there is no theoretical framework that based on what issue you are collecting that data. This data across Pakistan is conducted for rural urban areas, for all the most of the districts, for some tehsils and all that, and it's a nationally representative sample data. Based on weight, many researchers can use one or the other component or combination of component to conduct research with having theoretical framework, or they just conduct research and based on their analysis, they can come up with new theoretical frameworks and conceptual framework. So this is the basis of grounded theory. Another example is this Pakistan Demographic and Health Survey, PDHS. National Nutrition Survey is another example. Financial statistics that are available at national level for most of the countries in the world, they are also another example. Because they are collected with, with the aim that you have to understand what kind of economics and financial statistics are available for a country and not for a specific purpose having a theoretical or conceptual framework in mind. So grounded theory is basically collection of data that is without theoretical framework. So you collect number of uh, data on number of issues and then you try to kind of link these things to come up something that can help you to formulate new conceptual or theoretical frameworks. And the examples of these kind of data sets are nationally rep representative large data sets which does not cover a specific issue but it covers the whole livelihood of the people in rural urban areas so that researchers can use it and come up with one or the other theoretical framework or conceptual framework. This is how grounded theory can help us collect data, number one, and help us formulate or reformulate the already existing research uh, theories and conceptual framework. The four key features of grounded theory are that it's built through induction and deduction. It helps to predict and explain behavior, develops theory from data generated by observations, and interpretative process. So we will see one by one what is theory that is built through induction and deduction. We have already seen that there are two rigorous research processes which is one is induction, the other is deduction. What is induction in which we have data, we analyze data, we come up with some results and analysis and based on the analysis we come up with one or the other theoretical framework. And deduction is when we have a hypothesis in our mind, we collect data according to the hypothesis that we have, and based on that data collection, we analyze, we find some results, we conclude, and support or reject the hypothesis that we had. So induction is where we start from data and lead us to the theory, while deduction is we start with the theory and then we collect data and try to justify or nullify the theory that we have. So Theory is built through induction and deduction, and it is one of the key feature of grounded theory. It helps to predict and explain behavior. So grounded theory helps in predicting, uh, predicting and explaining behavior. So prediction is leading us towards induction, while behavioral explanation leads us to deduction. So if such kind of behavior exists, for the firms, for example, or marketing strategies, or marketing advertisement campaigns, so we can explain that behavior, or we can predict that behavior based on the data that we have had with us, using we have collected using grounded theory. It develops theory from data generated by observation. So we take observations from the data, we analyze it, we come up with one or the other argument based on the analysis, and then we try to develop 
a theory or conceptual framework from that. So this is how the data collected through grounded theory help us develop theory. It is an interpretative process. So you can interpret the whole process. So you have collected the data by this and that way. You have analyzed it by this and that method. And after that analysis, you come up with these results which help you to interpret the whole process in a way that makes sense. So it, it is actually an interpretative process. Ethnographic research, mostly used in social sciences like anthropology, sociology, and political science, not mainly used in business or management research, but there are some uses of this kind of research in management and financial sciences. So if you want to combine societal behaviors with that of the use of a product, for example, in marketing research, you can do an ethnographic research using ethnographic tools and ways and means to understand the societal process of how they adopt or not adopt to a particular product that you want to promote in that particular society. So it is a kind of research that helps to interpret the social world that research subject inhibits and the way in which they interpret it. So it interprets the social world of those who are living in that world. So the society in which one lives is basically the social world of that particular person. And if I want to see the world they are living in, I'm going to ask one or the other question. They can understand the question and interpret in their own way. So for example, cultural norms getting marriages, divorce pattern, living together, combined families, nuclear families, working woman concept and all these kind of things are the social world of particular society in which people live and organize their life. So how do people organize their life and understand things according to the society in which they live is actually, if it is research, it is come. It comes under ethnographic research. So ethnographic research helps in interpreting the social world that research in uh, subject inhibits and how they interpret it. Early marriages versus late marriages, divorce is it a good or a social taboo? So these kind of things are there. What are the key features of ethnographic research? It describes and explains the social world inhibited by the researcher and the subject. So the researcher is also going to be the part of that uh, lifestyle, that social world in which the subjects are living. So subject are basically those from where you are going to get the information. And if you are a researcher, you are going to get the information from the people who are living in that social world or society you want to work on. Why do people in rural areas do a lot of agriculture and not go for non-farming activities? Why poor are less educated? Why poor are less healthy? This kind of research, if you do in rural areas and you ask questions and all that, comes under ethnographic research only when you ask them their way or their perceptions about how do they see health or education for their own social well-being. And this helps the ethnographic researcher to understand the way people organize their lives. It takes place over an extended time period. It's not a research that completes in one month or two months. So you have to be extensively there in the field. Let's say for six months or more. Let's say for, for example, a year. There are researchers who have, uh, who have done research work for 15 to 16 months. They have stayed there, for example, in a village where they want to conduct their ethnographic research so they can understand their lifestyle within 24 hours, number one, within a week, number two, on weekdays, number three, on weekends, number four, on various occasions when a death occurs, when happiness occurs, when marriage occurs, let's say Eid coming in, or if it is a Christian society, let's say Christmas comes in, summer versus winter, 
cropping pattern, when they are sowing crops, how do they behave, when they are harvesting crops, how do they behave, when rains come in, what are their ways of celebrating it or what are their ways of not celebrating it. So you have to observe the various natural man-made phenomena that brings life in that society. And that helps you to interpret the life, the way, the social world in which the research subjects are living in. Ethnographic research is very important, especially when it comes to social science researches. It's also important in financial and management research to understand one or the other behavior of the people, but its main use is with social sociology, development studies, political science, and anthropology. So the key features include, it helps in describing the social world where subjects are living, and researchers also become the parts of that social world. Number two, it takes place in, over an extended time period. And number three, it is naturalistic. What is naturalistic? We'll see what is naturalism. It means that the researcher will be researching the phenomena within the context in which it occurs. So you don't see the change, you don't see the phenomena when it is already occurred. You have actually the part of that change. So if you are living there and let's say the floods comes in, how do people react to that? How do they help each other when one or the other disaster occurs in those days? So you basically become the part of that. That's why it's natural to see how people react to one or the other pain and pleasure when, they, when it comes to their life and how do you see them and interpret, interpret their way of social living. Not using data collection techniques that oversimplify the complexities of everyday life. You don't collect data based on, let's say, information of age, household member, in income consumption, this or that kind of stuff but you understand their whole life with your open eyes, living with them, living in the social world they are living in. So instead of simplifying the research by collecting a data for let's say in two, three months, you're actually living through the research. It's the process of living through the research. That's one of the in interesting sentence to describe naturalism that you as a researcher are living through research. So living through research means that you are spending your time 24 hours a day with your subjects to understand how do they spend their, their day and nights, how do they spend their evenings and mornings, how do they spend their afternoons and nights and these kind of phenomena so that you can understand their social world in which they are inhibiting, in which they are living, and in, in which they are interacting with each other. What is their behavior when it comes to female members of the society? What is their behavior when it comes to childs living in the same social fabric? So this is how you become a natural part of that social world in which you want to conduct your research. The most ethnographic strategies involve extended participant observation. So you not only observe the whole social world or society you are researching on, but there are few observation, uh, observers, few participants that, re that will remain the focus of your research so that you can ask them various interpretations, so that you can ask them various questions, you can understand with them you can indulge in the social activities through them. You can ask them to help you understand this or that kind of phenomena. So your extended participant observation is needed when you are conducting ethnographic research. And the term naturalism also refers to the use of the principles of scientific methods and the use of scientific model within research. So not only that you become part of that social world for which you are researching. You don't have to be out of the scientific modeling world. You have to understand that this is a systematic scientific process through which you are coming to collect information that you will analyze further 
and come up with inductive or deductive research study. You have to understand it's not that you include your personal choices or biases in that and research process become less rigorous, unsystematic and unscientific. And in that way it will not remain a research but it will, it will become a bogus research that we have already, already discussed in our very early lectures. So naturalism as also include your, your personal involvement in the social world you are researching on but at the same time you have to be scientifically systematically rigorous in your approach so that you can not only collect the information you need but you can also interpret the information according to how do these peoples or your subjects are organizing their life what are the changes that are occurring over time whether it is happening for better or not whether it is happening for good or not. So you have to understand the whole phenomena of life through living there, there and it's research that is going to be a part of your own life when you're conducting ethnographic research. So we have to understand that ethnographic research is a research where subjects are living in a social fabric where research can, a researcher can also be a part of that social fabric and then with having extending stay with these subjects you can observe their livelihood the way they organize their life and then you interpret the information you collect based on scientific methods and ways so naturalism can be in that it is researching the phenomena within the context in which it occurs. It's using the data collection techniques that does not oversimplify the complexities of our everyday life. And ethnographic strategy also involves extended participant observation. And naturalism also include the use of scientific model within research. So we have to understand these various phenomena so that we can come up with with a true ethnographic research. Time horizon. So before moving to this topic of time horizon, I'm just going to give you a simple idea of what is archival research. We're not going into the details of archival research because most of the time in your master's or graduate level dissertation, you're not going to use archival research, but one has to have an understanding of what is it actually. Archival research is, is searching the historical record in simple words for your understanding of historical phenomena. For example, when Pakistan and India became separated countries in 1947, what has happened when the people migrated? And if you want to see and observe that migration, you have to go to the archival history of India-Pakistan where you can find through various libraries the archival records where you have one or the other report that helps you understand what kind of migration occurs, how it occurs, what at that time people thought of various phenomena that were occurring at that particular period of time. So archival research is basically searching through the records available to you on various historical phenomena. You also have archival research in various forms. We are not going into the detail of that, but just simply understand that it's kind of historical record searching and keeping in view that how you can interpret and link this according to the research question or objectives we have in your mind. So we have till yet discussed various research strategies we have discussed experimental research that's normally done in natural sciences. We have discussed survey research that's normally done to conduct survey collecting information based on the questions you have formulated in the questionnaire. And then we have discussed case studies. Case study can be a, um, for extreme or uh, disaster cases where you want to see a phenomena how it is happening and occurring over time. And within case study, we have seen that we can have single or multiple case studies. We can have single unique extreme case to study or we can have multiple case studies so that we can generalize kind of observations that we have. 
or we have holistic or embedded case. Within holistic, we have studied that how do the whole organization behaves and interacts with one or the other way. While when we describe an organization into its various sub parts, it becomes an embedded research. And we have also seen and studied or try to understand that we can link single case study with holistic and embedded and multiple case study with holistic and embedded cases. And in this way we can use mix and match methods. And in today's lecture we have seen how various kind of research like ethnographic research can help us understand various real life phenomena and some other things that we have already discussed. And now we are talking about when we decide which kind of research strategy we are going to use, the next thing that we have to decide about our research is time horizon. So if we had decided that this is our research question and objective, and we are going to use survey research, we are going to use ethnographic research, we are going to use experimental research, we are going to use case study or what, then we have to decide about the time horizon we have to select an appropriate time horizon. We have to understand that whether we are going to use cross-sectional data or we are going to use longitudinal data or we are going to use time series data. Cross-sectional data is when a certain point of time you collect information from the various people. So this is study of a particular phenomenon or phenomena at a particular time. In summer, people eat more ice cream you ask questions why in summer people eat more ice cream and then you collect cross-sectional data. Same is the case with Pakistan Social Living Standard Measurement Survey in which you ask about what are the consumption expenditure, what is your income, how you use this income on health, how you use on education, how many children you have, what are their ages, how is the household composition and all that. But that's the information from number of households across Pakistan and rural and urban areas at one point of time. Let's say within few months or weeks, you collect this information across Pakistan. But you can have various other ways of data collection. The other thing is time series data. For example, GDP number. For example, interest rate, inflation over time. So these are all monthly, weekly, biannually, or six monthly numbers that you need over a period of time. So what was the per capita income in Pakistan in 1970, for example? 71, 72, so on till 2012. So this is a kind of time series. So you can plot time in a series and see how things are occurring over time. So you can have cross-sectional time horizon that within single point of time you can ask questions from various individuals or you can have over a period of time a data series that can have time series or you can have combination of both that you can ask at a certain point of time as certain information from various informants, variant observers, variant um, uh, interviewers, and then you can extend it over a period of time. So in June, people harvest wheat. You ask them this information about wheat harvesting in 2011. The same people used by you to collect that information in June 2012. Then again, the same people you ask these questions by you in 2013. So this is going to be over a period of time and within the same cross section. So your research participants are same, your observing phenomena is same, but it is over an extended period of time. So this is how you can come up with longitudinal data, the change in development over a period of time. Longitudinal data ch tells us about the change and development over a period of time. So we can have time horizon selection based on cross-sectional data, time series data, or longitudinal data. We have to understand, number one, 
our research topic, number two, our research question, number three, our research objectives. When we know where lies the focus of our research and what kind of research strategy we are going to use, is it experimental, is it survey, case study, anthropological, once we are decided about it, then we have to see what kind of time horizon we are going to use. Is it cross-sectional, time series or combination of cross-sectional and time series, that is longitudinal data. Once we are decided about our time horizon, then we are in a position to move further. To do analysis, find results and see whether the research findings are credible or not. And the important considerations, whether the research findings are credible or not, are these four. Number one, reliability. Number two, validity. Number three, generalizability. Number four, logical hurdles and false assumptions. So we have to understand these four things before interpreting our results and before, I mean, after interpreting our results, but before presenting it to the world. When we want to publish it, when we want to submit our dissertation, we have to understand that the data that we have analyzed using this or that research strategy and time horizon, whether it is credible or not. And credibility can be checked whether the data that we have collected and analyzed, can we have reliability? of that data and also the analysis that we have done and interpretation that we get. Are they valid? For example, if we are doing uh, research for in the context of Pakistan, are they valid for, for the contextual analysis of Pakistan? Can the results be generalizable or not? What if you did a single case study? Can that single unique or extreme case study findings be generalized to all case studies like that or not? And whether you have logical hurdles, for example, does that logically proves or not? Or your assumptions are false. What kind of assumptions you have used? Do they make sense when you analyze your data and interpret your data? Do they have any link with your research questions and objective? Contradiction with your research and ob objective? If that is not the case, then you can think that your research findings are credible and you can present it to the audience. You have to understand reliability, validity, generalizability, logical hurdles and false assumptions. If these important considerations are considered before, before presenting your results, then you will be in a good position to say whether your research findings are credible or not. And if you can say with surety that your research findings are credible, then you'll, you'll be in a position to go further. Research design ethics. So when you are designing your research, stepwise, starting from the focus, and this is your research questions and objectives, this is your general plan, that is your research study, that kind, that kind of research study, uh, research strategy you are going to use to collect your data, then you do this or that kind of analysis and all that, you must have ethics in your mind. We have already discussed in few lectures that ethical considerations are very important. So research design should not subject the research population to embarrassment. If you are talking about survey research, you did not ask questions like why you have this, uh, why you have poverty, why you have this small income, why you don't have this or that kind of stuff in your house, for example, if they don't have TV. So you can ask whether they have TV or not, but you don't allow to ask a question which feel them or makes them embarrassed to see that whether they have this kind of possession or not. That, that, that's one of the ethical consideration. Research population should not be harmed. You don't have certain stuff in your research, in your questionnaire that can have some harmful effect. For example, if you're doing political analysis of, of one or the other population or the sample you have chosen. So you didn't ask sensitive questions that can embark political 
contradictions and that can harm the research uh, uh, observers or informants and that lead to other material disadvantages so you don't have to think about the, the, the ways in which other material disadvantages can hurt your subject matter or the informants or the interviewer so these three ethical or four uh, three ethical consideration must kept in your mind when you are conducting your research or you are starting designing your research so these ethical things should be in your mind now we have done with this formulation of research design and research strategies this is this was one of the important aspect also which comes after literature review we have to understand that particular aspect carefully we, you have to go through slides and the chapter of the book that is relevant to this and now I'm going to summarize that what we have covered in past two or three lectures so that we understand what, what, what was the focus of our research design chapter why we studied this or that kind of things and what helps it can give us when we are designing our research so research design we do to convert to interpret to turn our research question and objective into let's say a research proposal or project or a dissertation if you're writing for your master and it must consider strategies choices and time horizon we discussed about strategies and choices it can be experimental it can be surveys can be case study this and that kind of thing and we describe also that what is an strategy it is our journal plan of action when we try to start our research once we have formulated research questions and objectives then we talked about what kind of choices we can have we can use single or we can have multiple methods we can have this or that kind of research strategy and we have also talked about in today's lecture about time horizon are we going to conduct a cross-sectional various people same time time series different time periods over a period of time and combination of cross-sectional and time series that is longitudinal various informants and various time periods so this is how we can have a research design that turns research questions and objectives into proposal and projects how research projects can be categorized we have also discussed it can be exploratory it can be explanatory it can be descriptive research project may be cross-sectional or longitudinal we have already discussed that and the important considerations while conducting research and focusing on research design is that the main research strategy may be combined in the same project so you can have survey research with cross-sectional information you can have survey research with the case study which is holistic or embedded so you can combine various research strategies in the same one project and when you collect data interpret and analyze the data should be valid or reliable your results that you have concluded should be valid and reliable access and ethical consideration whether you can have access to it or not whether others can have access to it or not and whether you have ethically considered the points that we have discussed that it should not harm the informant it should not be political, politically sensitive or socially sensitive and it should not give any disadvantage to the informant or observers for which you, on which you are doing your research so it, it has to have three important things validity, reliability, access and ethical considerations and, a, and one thing that is very important is that various research strategies can be combined in the same research project. I stop here. I thank you very much. We have at least finished three very important steps when we start writing our research within research methodology framework. We have started from our selection of topic 
and writing our research questions and objectives. Then we move to literature review and that too critically. How can we do critical review of literature? And then what is a research design? How is the focus of research design? What is a research strategy? What are the strategies that we can use? How and why? What are the key features of these research strategies? Then we have discussed about time horizons. What is the time horizon that is available to us? How we can make use of these things? How we can combine various research strategies together in the same project and, and get some output that we want to? What are the ethical considerations that we have to have in our mind that must be helpful not only for us to conduct research but for the interviewer or observer informants who cannot get harmed or disadvantaged because of this or that kind of research that we are considering. And finally and most importantly, the reliability and validity of the results that are coming out of the research. And a very important aspect of this is that your research uh, results are generalizable or not. If they are not, you have to have some limitations that you must pinpoint. And if they are generalizable, you have to have a logical argument that how they can be or in what circumstances they can be generalizable. Once you are in a position to design your research, after having your research questions and objectives, you will be in a good position to start collecting your data. You will be in a good position to start thinking of what kind of methodology you are going to use and you'll be in a better position to understand the whole process of how you are going to get this or that kind of information which will help you to interpret this or that way your research objectives and answer the question that you have asked. And once you're in a position to reply to these things, you will be in a good position to move further. Keeping in mind ethical issues, keeping in mind the consideration that your results are reliable and valid. And if these considerations are kept in mind and the assumptions are fulfilled, you are moving in right direction and in a systematic and scientific way. I stop here and we will start in our next lecture with the next new topic. Thank you very much.